Welcome to Book Sandwich Den 2022. Book Sandwich Den is a program of the Friends of the Southeast Steuben County Library and has been offered each year for many decades. The Friends of the Library help support the library with financially through their used book sales and insist in other ways as well. They will hold their annual meeting via Zoom following next week's book sandwich and presentation. Please plan to join us and learn more about their activities. I'm Louise Richardson, Chair of Book Sandwich and Selection Committee. I'd like to thank the other committee members for their good work this year. Margot Brown, Barbara Cook, Lisa Derrickson, Dusty Hewitt, Gary McCaslin, and Pam Sonnefeld. Choosing just six books is always a challenge as we strive for a mix of fiction and nonfiction, some serious and some lighthearted, but all substantive in their own way. This is our second year of presenting Book Sandwich in exclusively via Zoom. We had hoped to return to in-person meetings this year, but were thwarted once again by COVID-19. Today's book, A Children's Bible by Lydia Millett, was a finalist for the 2020 National Book Award and one of the New York Times 10 Best Books of the Year. There are four copies in the library system, and I'm pleased to say that they were all checked out. Today's presenter is Gary McCaslin, a former element, elementary school teacher and former pastor at the First Baptist Church in Painted Post. Gary's retired, but still preaching and conducting weddies, weddings and funerals. He's a big fan of science and in answer to the question, what other information would you like to share answered? I am part of a growing number of ministers who do not believe in hell, except for the hells we create on this earth. Since retiring, I have only been arrested once. He is also active in People for a Healthy Environment, a grassroots organization dedicated to informing and inspiring fellow citizens to safeguard our air, water, soil, and to maintain the health and natural beauty of our environment. If you've read a children's Bible, you'll understand why we thought Gary would be the right presenter for this book. We'll keep everyone muted during Gary's presentation, but we'll open the mics afterwards and hope you will join in discussion. One of the frustrations for me in presenting these uh, sessions virtually has been that the discussion has not been as lively as it always was in person. You may ask, also ask questions or make comments anytime via the chat, which I will moderate. Thanks so much for putting aside your Zoom fatigue to join us today. We hope to see you for the next five weeks as well for an interesting lineup of books and presenters. So here's Gary. Thank you very much, Louise. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, invite you to join me as we acknowledge, remember and honor Native Americans on whose unceded lands we gather today. The ancestral lands of the indigenous Susquehanna, Iroquois, Seneca, Cayuta, and Onondaga nations. I want to get back to me, right? <laughs> Before I begin, I just have a few, a few comments. Is this where it should be? Looking, Marshall. Are you sharing? Am I sharing? <laughs> okay, what's that? Okay, all right. Um, I just have a few comments. Number one, I I, I miss Jean Wozinski. Uh, she passed away here recently. I used to stay for a seat in the very front row and uh, she would listen very attentively. And then at the end, she'd tell me all the things I said that were wrong. And I loved her very much. <laughs> I also like to simply thank you for watching today. As Louise said, we all have uh, COVID fatigue and we're setting that aside so that we could be here. Uh, the precautions that we're making hopefully are, are not too cumbersome and helping you to keep, helping us all to keep safe. So we thank this. So you, we thank you for this wonderful library and the book sandwiching committee. I thank you for your careful structuring of this series. And one more item. 
Louise will be monitoring the chat line so you can provide questions or comments during my talk and we can get to them at the end. Uh, but because our Zoom, because our Zoom program, uh, I will not have many of the usual nonverbal cues that I like to receive when I am uh, preaching, ministers like those. And so I'm going to ask you to include in your chat, if you feel so moved, if you can pass along some of these, some uh, nonverbal cues to Louise that, that might add to our interactions. For example, I have one here. If you just type in A-N, A-N, uh, that means amuse nod. You can just, you know, nod like that. And then the second one is S-N, that's a sympathetic nod, that's a little concern. And then uh, the next one, uh, no, these are just suggestions. Uh, E-R-I-D, that's uh, eyes raised in disbelief. Unbelievable. And of course, the last one, you guessed it, uh, BL, uh, boisterous laughter. That's uh, always one of my favorites. So uh, I think we're ready. Uh, one of the realizations that came to me in preparing for uh, uh, today is that the uh, author of the children's Bible, Lydia Millette, is almost as sneaky as Louise Richardson. <laughs> Uh, I say this because Louise mentioned, not to me directly, but very casually in a book sandwiched in meeting, she said, oh, Gary would be great for that one because he loves the environment so much. Well, I, I do care quite a bit about the environment, but the title of the book, The Children's Bible, did not immediately connect my mind to the environment. The Bible may be from my, my history with the ministry, but not the environment directly. But sometimes... Some time passed, and with her suggestion already in my mind, Louise then asked me directly to review the children's Bible. And without doing any research, I said yes, and I try, because I trust and, uh, Louise. And um, if you've been in conversation with her, you know she can be very persuasive, sort of like on Star Trek when the Borg says, resistance is futile. So I read the book. I read the book, and uh, it was nothing like I expected. <laughs> Perhaps if I had just read one paragraph on the back cover, I'll read from the back cover. A children's book follows, a children's Bible follows a group of 12 eerily mature children who faced a, on a vacation with their families at a sprawling lakeside mansion. Contemptuous of their parents, the children decide to run away when a destructive storm descends on the summer estate, embarking on a dangerous foray into the apocalyptic chaos outside. Her prophetic and heartbreaking story of generational divide offers a haunting vision. But what awaits us on the other side of Revelation? And there's a biblical comment right there. And here's my transition. Lyd Lydia Millette does the same kind of thing. She begins this book, The Children's Bible, in an idyllic setting. A group of old college roommates have rented a huge mansion in the woods by a river that leads down to the ocean. The exact location is not specified, but I'm guessing it's somewhere a little north of uh, New York City. And we read from page one. Once we lived in the summer country. In the woods, there were tree houses. On the lake, there were boats. Even the smallest canoe could take us down to the ocean. We'd paddle across the lake, over a marsh, down a stream, and come to a river's mouth, where the water met the sky. We'd run along the beach in the salt breezes, leaving our boats in the sand. We found a skull of a dinosaur, or maybe it was a porpoise. We found skate eggs and shark eyes and shark eye shells and sea glass. Before sunset, we'd paddle across the lake. Returning for dinner, loons sent their haunting calls across the water to wash the sand from our ankles. We jumped off the dock. We screamed, we dove, and flipped as the sky turned violet. Who wouldn't love to spend a whole summer in a spot like that? What could, what could possibly go wrong? What a lovely setup for a story, but a few pages into chapter one, we can all, already see a little unraveling. And by the time chapter three rolls around, the nature of this idyllic setting starts to come apart at the seams. In a phrase, we can say, all hell starts to break loose. In fact, by the time chapter four arrives, I could not put the book down because it kept getting more and more disastrous. And I kept wondering how this ship was going to ever be righted. At several points along the way, I said to myself, Louise, what did you get me into? And how am I going to review this little epistle? And to Lydia Millette, I said, how are you going to salvage this story so that you still deserve a National Book Award to be a National Book Award finalist? Let me back up and provide a little more context. Chapter one is a basic information on location. Uh, the families are not super rich uh, in America, but they had enough money to split the rent in order to, to stay for the entire summer. And for some of the rent, for some, the rent was no problem. 
a few had to borrow some money to come along. It was hard to know which parents belonged to which kids because they were constantly playing this game where no parent wanted to admit which adult was their relation. The last one standing whose parents was not chosen uh, wins a prize in their, in their circle. Right from the beginning, there was a separation between the generations, uh, but it's a kind of, it was kind of natural. The parents whose names were never mentioned except Evie's mom or Terry's dad, quickly almost dismissed the children from their minds, probably because the children found it very easy to entertain themselves due to the setting and the parents' negligence. This negligence was accentuated by some <clears throat> what we'd call hedonistic behavior of the parents, which the older, of which the older children were very aware, drinking from dawn to dusk, displaying the worst kind of uh, too much alcohol and pairing off in second floor bedrooms. The children were rightfully disgusted. The only time everyone was together was the evening meal. And even then the children sought to have themselves dismissed from the table as quickly as possible. In fact, the children did not need the guidance because the older kids took care of the younger and the diversity of each child was enhanced by a common goal that they all shared. They pledged one another to get away with as much as possible because it was simply a great game to see how much mayhem they could cause and not be caught. Evie is the narrator of the story. Let me just jump in here one more second. I apologize for taking off my glasses every time I have to read out of the book. I have an appointment with my ophthalmologist um, later in the month, and this will be remedied. Uh, here's a parent, a pair, a couple, pair, a couple lines on that uh, game they're playing. We were in, we were strict with the parents. Punitive measures were taken: thievery, mockery, contamination of food and drink. They didn't notice, and we believed punishments fit the crimes. Although the worst of these crimes was hard to pin down and therefore hard to punish correctly, the very quality of their being the essence of their personalities. Evie is the narrator of the story. One evening she was alone on the dock and reflected on where she was in her life. Her words represent in many ways the outlook for the future of all the children in the story. Yes, it was known that we couldn't stay young, but it was hard to believe somehow. Say what you like about us. Our legs were arms and were strong and streamlined. I realize that now our stomachs were taut and unwrinkled, our foreheads similar. When we ran, if we chose to, we, we ran like the flashes of silk. We had the vigor of, fresh, of, of, of those freshly born, relatively speaking. And no, we wouldn't be like this forever. We knew it on a rational level. But the idea of those garbage-like figures that tottered around the great house were a vision of what lay in store. Hell no. And where had their goals gone? A simple sense of self-respect? They shamed us. They were a cautionary tale. So far, we're only still in the first chapter. At this point, I do not see how the Bible fits into uh, this story. And I am rooting for the kids. They are caring and they are funny. As a side note, this is one of the most creative aspects of the story that I thoroughly enjoyed. Millet reads a humorous, I'm sorry, Millet tells a humorous dystopian story of an apocalypse as it is revealed through the eyes and the actions of children. In my mind, it's like she's a cross between Jane Goodall and George Carlin. Uh, Goodall, who spent time with apes and chimps and practically came to know how they think and act, and Carlin, who was insightfully funny, but so often we have to use his, uh, we have to forgive his use of crude and raw humor. Millette knows children. She knows how they think and act. She must have spent a lot of time hanging out in the hallways of schools because her insights are right on. And Carlin, I will not be sharing examples in this review. And, and, she, and she wrote like Carlin, uh, I won't be sharing examples of, of uh, the children's language in this review, but the out of sight language of young people is right on. And uh, it's, it shows again that she, she knows what she's talking about. Chapter two is all about a, a sleepover on a, on a nearby island. Soon after the children arrive there, they're visited by a group of young people who arrive on a huge luxury yacht. 
servants come out and set up the tents for the young people. They cook the meals. They're college age students. Uh, their presence was an obnoxious display of wealth. This big boat was, was friendly, however, and, had, and they had nothing to lose by sharing snacks and offering a little weed to the older kids. But during the times they were together, the mansion kids held their own and remained together. In chapter three, a massive hurricane passes through the area and there's tremendous damage to the mansion. Windows are smashed, floodwaters rise and fill the basement. A hole in the roof allows water to come into the third floor where the children sleep. Electricity is knocked out. The parents are trying to handle a much needed emergency repairs, but they're having difficulties due to the continued use of alcohol and some occasional drugs to ease, to ease the pain of realizing everything is falling apart. It's a massive storm, a hurricane so bad that the parents are only proven to be less and less able to handle the situation. That the, the, the situation getting so bad that the children leave the house and take refuge in a treehouse where Eve's precocious little brother, Jack, and his sidekick, Shell, who is deaf and only signs, have collected a menagerie of animals who had lost their homes in a storm. Now, before we go any further here, I need to provide a little background, a little more background for Jack, Evie's younger brother. Evie and Jack's parents never took the kids to church. When they were driving one time, Jack asked his mother, what, what does that big plus, that long plus sign mean that's up over on, that, on the top of the church? And the mother, mother responds, it's all about a bunch of stories. Unbeknownst to Jack's parents, one of the women staying in the mansion gave Jack a children's Bible. And since he loved to read and had never seen one before, Jack devoured the stories with an enlightened innocence. When Evie asked her brother, what are you doing with all these boxes here? Jack answered. Let me read it for you. What are all these boxes, Jack? I asked. You know how in the book that the lady gave me after they left that beautiful garden, there was a really big flood? He's reading the Bible, said Jen, another one of the young people. We can talk about your book later, I said, but for now on, let's go into the house. You're not safe out here. Evie said, Jack, we have to save the animals, just like Noah. That was when I looked around at the stack boxes. I saw two bird cages, fluttering movements inside, holes punched in one box, two box, three, four, a furry brown snout poked out of the grill on a plastic pet carrier. We collected them, said Jack. Wild animals, I asked. A bunny's the one that bit me, he said. Maybe he thought my finger was a carrot. The guy's got to come in. You guys got to come into the house right now, said Jen. Well, we can't, said Jack. And Shell grabbed her arm and, and signed her frantically. Why not, Jack? Aren't you old enough? Aren't you getting cold out here and hungry? We have food and we have moved everyone. Plus the owl won't go in the house. No way, he's hurt. The owl? Jack pointed to the branches. I, I couldn't see. He's a barn owl and he's got a broken wing. You realize, Jack, that rabbits and owls don't really chill together. It's not like in the picture books where woodland creatures put on dresses and square dance at picnics. But see, we have to feed him and he can't fly, said Jack. The parents could notice if these kids aren't in the house right now, said Jen, and it's me who's gonna get punished. We're not going, said Jack. He lifted, the, he lifted uh, his chin. Uh, Shell took his hand in solidarity and Jen moved toward him, maybe to grab him by the arm, but he did something quick and it surprised us all. He pulled back the thick metal bracelet of the, out of his pocket hoodie and clicked it onto his wrist, a silver glint of the dimness. Then he clicked it again. He had handcuffed himself to the treehouse. So Jack's, Jack's uh, children's Bible remains a key element all the way through the story. The next morning, Jack showed his sister the rest of the animal collection. He had an owl, rabbits, a uh, possum, two doves, a robin, small brown bird, a crayfish, a toad, some field mice, and a fish swimming in a big cooking pot. When asked about the beehive that they had in the basement, Jack proudly said, the bees all gathered in the hive, and so we just brought them right up here to the treehouse. At the beginning of chapter four, thoughts about this, thoughts about an exile began. The parents were incompetent and uncaring and the children could not go inside and leave the animals. A second storm, equally as powerful, if not more so, came knocking down more trees and flooding the house again. It took three days for the water to recede. And when it did, the children began to make specific plans for the exile. 
a girl named Juicy suggested, listen, let's hijack some cars and drive to her to our, my house. It's a relatively short distance away. First, they held a funeral service for all the fish that had washed up on the land and were stranded and died. After the service, they noticed a yellow blow up raft in the clump of reeds in the cove by the lake. On the left, Rhea, on the raft laid a small man fast asleep. Jack shouted, they found a guy in some reeds in my book too. And then they took him to the princess of Egypt. There's no princess around here, Jack. Burl was the groundskeeper. This was the man. Burl, Burl was a groundskeeper for many of the families who lived in these huge mansions. And he was quickly, and he quickly became a comrade in the exile plan. He became extremely valuable when all the roads to Juicy's house were blocked by trees or down power lines. But Burl knew that a farm was closer that had been used as a vacation spot and Burl knew the owner. Burl led the children to safety and began one of the more calm and productive periods in the story. There was a big house, a barn, a lookout, lots of fields to run and play and climb, trees to climb and no parents around and far away from any rising water. Amidst the farm, amidst all the farm offered, their delight was tempered by news. <laughs> Sorry, just a minute here. Was tempered by news. Oh. We read how the storm had flooded the subway in New York and in Boston. The river had overflowed its banks, downed power lines, electrocuted drivers, the cars and garbage cans and pets had been swept down the streets and looked like rushing rivers. We watched a video of collapsing homes. Don't you think they just like rerun the same footage from every hurricane before, asked, asked one of the kids. Usually it was Florida, Louisiana or other places that none of us lived. But now it claimed a lot of houses clo of closer location, pine trees whipping around instead of palms. Riots, they said, looting, states of emergency. The president had promised some money. One day, there won't be any money left, pronounced Terry. Even the apps will stop working, said Suki. They were downcast there, there in the cottage, downcast and uncertain, relieved to be where they were for sure. But out there beyond the field of view, the options were shrinking, choices were being removed. The exile was enhanced, however, by the arrival of the angels. Apparently, there are groups of people called trail angels in the hiking community, people who take sections of the Appalachian Trail and, and as they hike, they leave in random locations water and food provision for hikers. This crew had just come off the trail and discovered the farm. They stayed for, a, they decided to stay and they all had skills to share. Luca had some EMT training. Darla was a poet and a friend of the humanities, but the favorite was Maddie. When uh, daily routines became boring, the angels set up a school and Maddie taught science. He brought up images on his computer and shared the wonders of biology and astronomy. The kids loved him. Chapter, chapter six is all about settling into the farm. Fall was beginning to arrive. And there were occasional contacts with parents, but many of them contracted a fever and the children were told to stay away. While everyone was, was into their routines, there was a new kind of tension in the air. Burl had to leave the farm to run an errand and he was debriefed when he returned. What you have out there, Burl said, is some folks pretty frightened, some armed to the teeth, the road systems useless. So far, so far as getting to your house in Westchester, look, he looked to juice, it's no dice. Even if the roads were passable, we wouldn't be able to fuel up. There, there, there was a run on gas. The pumps that aren't dry are locked down by crazies. Saw a gas station with a yellow Jeep guarding the entrance, guys holding rifles. Farm life continued, but it was definitely subdued. Right smack in the midst of all this tension, Lydia Millet drops in a little of Jack's theology, which is what he picked up from the children's Bible and a careful examination of what his life had offered him to this point. The kids were in school in Darla's class one day when Jack became, uh, she was teaching the humanities. Jack was a little bored. And so he got out his Bible and he started looking at it. Darla asked him if this was his favorite book. And he said, 
No, it's actually my fifth favorite book. My, my, my favorites are Frog and Toad, George and Martha, the Guinness Book, and then Laugh Out Loud Jokes. What do you like about this Bible book? Well, mostly that it's a mystery. A mystery. We solved a lot of it, said Jack. The first clue was God's code for nature. And then we figured out the Trinity thing with God and Jesus. What did you figure out, honey? Jack's eyes flirted over to Shell, who was signing furiously. So if God stands for nature, then Jesus stands for science. That's why we call Jesus God's son. It doesn't mean he's an actual son. God doesn't have sperm. You mean, you mean science comes from nature? It just means that science comes from nature. He tipped his notebook and he showed them a picture. This is where it gets tricky, Marshall. There it is right there. This is, the, this is the, what he had written in his notebook. Nature, God at the top, knowing stuff. Whoops, sorry, can't see it. I can see it. It's filled up the whole screen. <laughs> what? Oh. How's that? Perfect. There's nature at the, their nature. God is at the top, knowing stuff, making, knowing stuff is Jesus and science, and making stuff is the Holy Ghost. And the proof is there's lots, of, there's lots the same with, with Jesus and science, said Jack. Life for science to save us, we, I'm sorry, like for science to save us, we have to believe in it. Same with Jesus. You believe in Jesus, he can save you. That makes like zero sense, small dude, said Juicy. It does make sense, Jack insisted. See this, Juicy? Science comes from nature. It's kind of a branch of it. Like Jesus is a branch of God. And if we believe in science, then we can act and we can be saved. Saved, like you mean go to heaven? Sherlock Holmes, that's some Santa Claus kind of crap. No, like the earth, I like, like the earth, the climate, the animals. Heaven's part of the code. It just means a good place for us all to live. Look, said Jack to, June, to Juicy earnestly. He turned the page in the notebook. These are the miracles of Jesus, right? But they're all what science does too. Almost, here, look at the proof. And this is the chart that he showed. Can you see that? All set. So Jesus equals science. Then we have uh, Jesus heals the sick. Uh, Jesus and science um, makes people blind, makes blind people see. Jesus can do that. Science does it. Uh, turns, turns hardly any food into lots of food. Walks on water. Hovercraft, exclamation mark. Uh, raises the dead. Okay, we'll give that one. <laughs> but four out of five, he says, that's pretty good. Okay, you are very ignorant, said Shell out loud. Sheldon, said Darla after a moment, face wreathed and smiles. Sheldon, Sheldon, you can talk. I never heard him speak before either. I, I, I'd known that he could talk. Jack and Jen told me that he could, but Sheldon only spoke on special occasions. Juicy's ignorance qualified, I guess. Sure, he can talk, said Jack. What a wonderful self-expression, honey, said Darla to Shell. Humanity is, is over. In other words, the class was done. I'm not going to do any more there. Uh, okay, I'm back on now. Pardon me. Yeah, I did that. I did it up at the top up here. I'm un unmuted now. Can you see me? Yeah, you can see me. Oh, two 
Mm, and that's it. Yeah. Well, I see the green thing up here. Well, we're going to have to get some help here. That's, that's it? You can see me now? Oh, good. Okay. I can't see you, but that's all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, I, wrote, I have a little note here. I can't wait. When they make a movie of this, uh, of this book, I can't wait to see who they cast as, uh, as um, Jack. It sounds like he'd be wonderful. Millet also occasionally inserts paragraphs where Jack's older sister, Evie, she's the primary uh, narrator of the story, is simply reflecting for a moment. Her words are a combination of meditation and poetry, and there are, sprink there are sprinkled throughout the book. This one is one of my favorites. I got into the habit of walking around the farm by myself when the rain was light. I'd find a quiet place and just stand there listening to the patter of drops on the leaves in the ground, I closed my eyes to see what else I could hear. I practiced forgetting what was beyond me and noticing only where I was. I practiced being wet and cold and hungry and not minding. Sometimes I took Jack with me along with a field guide from the, from the closet. We continued, we consulted through plastic. We learned the names of trees and bushes and looked up their histories. We learned which had grown here from the time of the Indians which had been brought from far away. Maples from Norway, mulberries from Asia, Siberian elm, and a tree from China called the Empress. And then right on the heels of that quiet, peaceful moment on the very next page, we read, we were sitting around the table in the, in the kitchen when a man we had never seen before walked right into the house. He slid a gun from his coat. We got up quickly. He smelled bad, not like, not like sweat, but something else, gas maybe, motor oil and raw meat, Rafe said later. He had gray hair and a crew cut and a bushy beard like all men suddenly. He was wearing filthy jeans and a camo vest over a bright t-shirt, the orange of pylons. There was an edge of energy in him like a sick buzz. He showed the gun to us. Matter of fact, look, it looked heavy. He said, How'd you end up sitting here, kids, all fat and happy? We stared at him. We were not fat. We didn't feel too happy either. He said, what's your secret? He didn't say it nicely. Gesturing with his gun, he made us all file out the door. At this point, you have, to, uh, you have less than a quarter of the book left. And there's no way you can stop reading. I hope you don't come to that point late at night. With no apologies, I'm not going to detail what happens in the next chapter, except to say that one of the trail ma angels, Maddie, the one who was the favorite, was tortured because uh, when he was interrogated, when the kids were interrogated regarding food and supplies, the kids would not answer the boss qu boss's questions quickly enough. Three of the goats on the farm were that the kids treated as much loved pets uh, were shot for food and shot for food for the gunslinging gang. And one, of the, and one of the pets, one of the goats was butchered right there in front of the children. In the end, no one died in the standoff where the children were saved. The barn burned to the ground, but everyone was, everyone was okay. It was quite dramatic. Very soon after the save, the parents came and everyone was able to drive to Juicy's house, which was huge and would accommodate everyone. Driving to the house, they passed through areas that were still a disaster. The destruction and smells of dead animals, abandoned cars, piles of garbage made the ride difficult to endure. After Jack saw the first dead animal, he got tears in his eyes, stopped looking outside. He and Shell stared down at the game on their, the games on their tablets when the bright palaces stood, where bright palaces stood on a green hill. Through the glass, he saw signs of life, workmen running around carrying loops of cables and shouldering ladders, yelling over their shoulders. We passed road crews wearing high, v, high visibility jackets and hard hats. We passed a crane of linemen working on utility poles. We passed other families in cars, which were crowded like ours. 
Children gazed back at us from their own rear windows. The land had a different texture, old and tired, almost derelict. A little bit later, as we got close to Juicy's neighborhood, the streets were cleaner. The piles of dead animals tapered off and there were more crews fixing the phones and electricity. Around us, mansions were set back from the road where elaborate land and where there was with elaborate landscaping. Massive rolling lawns had been mowed, garbage had been collected. The other half, said Jen. We're the other half, I said, Evie said, for now at least. For it's all for now, said Jack. He sounded 83. We pulled up behind the other cars at some small, at some tall metal gates. An initial in the metal script on the top looked tacky. We sat there waiting for the gates to open. Look, see, the promised land, I said to Jack and nudged him into a glance to look up at the tablet, look up from his tablet. We had already, we had, we already had the promised land, Evie, he said softly. Hey, Jack said my father, trying to catch his eye in the rearview mirror, summoning a smile that looked fake in a jocular tone. Chin up, kid, everything's gonna be okay. Jack switched his tablet off and flipped it over, rested his hands on it, neatly folded together. That's what you always said. His voice was very soft. You're my father, but you're a liar. From the front seat, there was only silence. The first few weeks when everybody living together, uh, there were very few conflicts. Eventually, uh, the routines broke down. The adults provided no leadership. Children devised games to play, assigned jobs with rewards for jobs well done. Extras, they tried to initiate exercise routines. Over time though, a new darkness settled on the parents. Crashing stock markets was a factor, the weather, it wasn't storming where, the, where we were, but there were many storms elsewhere and droughts brought heat waves, cold, hot, cold and hot fronts, defunct trade routes, everywhere seemed to be in flux. The weather shut down airports, ruined crops, destabilizing the markets, in quotes. The North Pole was far too warm, parts of Europe were freezing. Plus the domestic staff there at, the, at Juicy's house had quit. The parents complained indignant. There was also, it was so sudden they said, They'd all been told there was more time, way more. It was someone's fault, that's for sure. Not the scientists, said one, said one of the kids. Those guys tried their best, maybe the politicians, maybe some journalists. And we heard discussions about hoarding, the pros and cons of stockpiling commodities. What would be the best currency, gold, weapons, ammunition, batteries? No consensus. So shipments started arriving constantly. There were solar panels, dried goods, medicines, some of the parents spent days unpacking them. Phrases like disease migration and parasites were bandied about. Trucks arrived with bottled water, not little spring, not little bottles of spring water. These were huge, huge barrels, water stored in the corrugated metal warehouse that workers had constructed while they were living in the great house. The first few weeks went by after that with few conflicts. Eventually the routines broke down. The adults provided no leadership. Event the children devised games to play, assigned jobs with rewards for jobs well done. Again, more exercise routines, darkness settled on them. The adults beefed up security around the house. They built a second wall around, around it, attempting to wall out the reality that was becoming more and more apparent. And over time, the adults became less and less dependable to do anything. Their, their existence was completely dependent on the children to provide guidance. Until one morning, when we woke up, the parents were simply gone. They'd left their phones, their wallets, all their personal belongings. There were, they were nowhere on the property. We combed the empty streets nearby, first on foot, 
and then only the only car that still ran, the electric one. We couldn't find them. The last page is the most difficult to read. Uh, Lydia Millette tells us about a conversation that Evie has with her sweet little brother who is now sick. And uh, I, uh, I'm gonna hold off on, on reading that one um, because I wanna see if anybody has any questions at this point. Do you have any that, that you received, Louise? Uh, no, so... Okay. Questions, comments, anyone? You can either use the chat or unmute yourself. No? I, I have two. Uh, Gary. Yeah, Margo, you need to unmute yourself. I did, but then I was promptly muted again. Okay, am I all right now? Margo, can can't hear you. I've unmuted. Oh, yeah. Volume's up. There it is. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I've all through this, I've been wondering how many children are we actually talking about? How many families, how many adults were the main basis? It doesn't actually, it, it doesn't actually say how many um families there are but from uh, seeing the relationship to the kids there are about 11 11 children and uh, some of the parents uh, came as uh, came alone so i'm guessing maybe um 11 i i i charted it out about 11 families all And Gary, there's a question on the ages of the children. Uh, the youngest were a set of twins, probably about six or seven, up through uh, high school. And I think one young man was was uh, going off, was getting ready to go off to college. Those kind of details are very sketchy about the book. Let me, let me, I, I, what, maybe I'll read, I'll read my uh, two reflections that I have here at the end. And if there's time, uh, if people would, I could, I could read the last page. Um, pardon me. Okay. Two, uh, two notes that I would uh, offer. Oh. Uh, First, I find myself sometimes waking up and being reminded of the fact that my existence is simply a life of luxury. There are almost an infinite number of aspects of my days that I simply take for granted. Clean air to breathe, a grocery store with items that will fill my stomach with a wide variety of nourishing foods and drink that literally come from all over the world. Last time I looked at a package of blueberries from Wegmans, I found out they came from Peru. Clothes I can buy that fit, keep me warm, comfortable at prices that I can afford. I can call my sister in Atlanta, friends all over the country. I can know what's happening in my state, in the world through the gift of an electronic grid whose inner workings I could not begin to understand. I flush my toilet and I never once worry about any kind of long-term concern about my waste. I could go on, but you get the idea. We all live within a wildly complex grid of routines that we never consider, hardly ever consider, that nourish our bodies and our souls and give our lives meaning. In Lydia Millett's book of only 224 pages with big print and generous spacing, which I believe some of you could probably read in an evening, she gently and cleverly presents the reader with a possible vision of what life would be like if that wildly complex grid of routines came crashing down. I wanna thank Louise for thinking of me and uh, offering the opportunity to review this book. To all of you who do plan to read it, I cannot emphasize enough to read it twice. 
I found myself reading it so fast the first time because it kept unfolding in a way that I, I couldn't wait to see what was going to happen, what was going to be coming around the corner. And the second time through, I saw so many little allegorical gems that Liddy had dropped along the way. I enjoyed it so much more the second time, second time around. I realize we're sort of close to our time here. Do you, is there time to read that last page, you think? Okay. <laughs> it's kind of a tear jerk. <laughs> The last, this last section starts like this. What happens at the end, Jack asked me. This is Jack talking to Lydia. Jack was sick by now. He was going to make, uh, I was going to make sure that he got better. Whenever I wasn't at his bedside, I was researching symptoms and diagnoses, how to repurpose the medicines we had, home remedies. I wish the angels were still here with us, Luca and Maddie, or even the owner. Still, I was dedicated. If it was, the, if it was the only fine thing I ever did, the single worthwhile thing, one day he'd be all right again. The end of what, Jack? He had had, he said. What what happens in the end? The end of what, Jack? You know the story after the chaos time. He wasn't. It wasn't in my book. All book, but all books should have a real ending. They should. I agreed. She said the real end wasn't even in the kids version. And that wasn't nice, too violent. She said the children couldn't hardly stand, hardly handle revelation. Sorry, Jack said too violent. The, the, the end of the story was too violent for kids that children couldn't handle the relevation. I think she said revelation. So what happens after the end? Let me think, hold on for a minute, I'm thinking. Think better, Evie. Okay, slowness, I bet. New kinds of animals evolve. Some other creatures came, come and live here like we did. And all the beautiful things will still be in the air, invisible, but like, I don't know, an expectation that sort of hovers even when we're all gone. But we won't be here to see them. We won't be here. It hurts not to know. We won't be here to see. He was agitated. I held his hand. Others will be here, honey. Think of them. Maybe the ants, the trees, the plants, maybe the flowers will be our eyes. Flowers don't have eyes. That's like something Darla would say. It's not science, Evie. You're right. It's more like art and poetry. But it all still comes from what they used to call God, doesn't it? What they used to call God, he murmured. He was happiest when I was there talking to him, but he was getting so tired these days, so very tired. You had it in your notebook, right? You wrote it down, didn't you? I wrote it down. I think you solved it, Jack. In your notebook, Jesus was science, knowing stuff, right? And the Holy Ghost was all those things that, make, that people make. You remember your diagram about making stuff? Yes, I did. So maybe the Holy Ghost, maybe art is the ghost in the machine. Art is the ghost? The comets and the stars will be our eyes, I told him. And I went on, the clouds and the moon, the dirt, the rocks, the water, the sand, the wind. We call that hope, you see. So thank you very much again, Louise. So Gary, actually that leads into, there's a couple questions. Okay. Could you elaborate on some of the allegorical gems you liked most? Thanks, Marshall. And did you find the book hopeful or depressing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to admit, the majority of the allegorical gems also, I mean, the, the, the allegorical gems came also from uh, some research I did. When I Googled uh, 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 Lydia Millet, I mean, it doesn't say I am. No, okay, go. It's okay. I'm all set. Uh, a lot of the allegorical gems came from um, uh, from uh, an interviews and uh, written interviews that were uh, that were available on Google just with uh, 
Googling the book and, and Lydia. Uh, but some of, the, some of the more interesting ones, uh, Burl, the fellow who was found in the reeds and led the people, children to the promised land. Who does that remind you of in the Bible? Pardon me? Mo Moisha, yes, Moses, that's right. Uh, the, the, I, didn't read, I didn't read the part about, um, about the uh, torturing, but one of the ways that, the, uh, that Maddie, uh, the one who was the scientist and loved the kids so much and they loved him, he was, he was tortured. He, the, he was told to put his hand on a table and uh, one of the bad guys put staples in his hand. And, and a little bit later on, they hung him from a tree. So who would that remind you of? Jesus on the cross. Um, Luca, uh, the, the uh, angel who had medical, uh, uh, who had medical background. Uh, there's, it reminds me of, of Luke, the physician. Um, Val, who was always hanging around with Burl, uh, reminded folks of Aaron, Moses' uh, uh, brother and spokesperson. Um, let's see who the other ones here. The angels. There were four of them that came down, but uh, came into the group. But uh, some folks said that reminded them of the three wise men, and I could go along with that. Um, the the fellow who was uh, the leader of the people, the gang who came in with the guns, uh, he was called the governor. He, that was his nickname that he was called. Uh, people thought that that might be a reference to uh, Pontius Pilate. Um, and I, I don't want to give away too much about the uh, uh, about the about how everybody was saved because that is a rather dramatic part of the story. But there's no way that you couldn't think about that that person in charge as God. And from what I was able to uh, what I was able to decipher, it was a black woman, which I say right on, <laughs> right imagery all the way. Uh, let's see. Those are those are the main the main parts. The, and to be quite honest, uh, most of them came not from Lydia, but from um, from the readers. A lot of folks thought that Jack was like a Christ figure, also little Jack, with his perceptions and uh, the way he integrated science and and uh, and religion all together. Oh, and the other one, um, the other one that was. Uh, I hadn't. I definitely didn't think about that yacht that came up on the shore, at the at the beginning. I think it was in chapter two or three. Uh, that was a reference to uh, um, uh, Satan. Uh, the name of the yacht was Cobra, and um, they just it was it was an obnoxious kind of wealth. They were flaunting it and throwing it in people's faces and. And even in that early part in the story, though the, the people who those uh, college students were both talking about their family bunkers where they would go in case there was some kind of an apocalypse where they had huge caches of food and, um, and security and air systems and, and, uh, and backup. So there were a lot of, there were a lot of different uh, allegorical references, but I'm sure that there are more in there. Um, but I'm only slightly embarrassed as administrator and catch more of them. But, <laughs> but that's the way it goes. Pardon me? Retired, Retired minister, I'm allowed off, right? That's why. Right. Oh, God. No, I don't see it as hopeful unless uh, uh, some people who are still climate deniers read it and get some kind of a jolt out of it. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, you, you can't. You, the problem with the with the story is that it's it's an allegory and it is a story, but you could point to several parts of it and say, yeah, that could happen. That could happen. I mean, we, we are so devastated when one storm comes through an area. What if three of them came through, which is what happened in the story, and they, they and they do a wider swath of destruction. No, it's uh, it's not. It's hopeful in the sense that if more people were to read it, I think it might might turn some heads. Um, as I say, those the, like the reflection I had at the end there, this book made me think more about the preciousness of my just simple existence more than any book I've read in a long time. So I would say that the hopeful thing to me about it mm -hmm. was that the children were so much 
more aware and caring than the parents. Yes. And, and there certainly is in this the implication that <clears throat> our generation dropped the ball on a lot of this stuff. Right, right. And kids are now faced with a very uncertain future and don't see us doing anything about it. Right. So exactly. And um, the kids, the kids, the kids, the problem is the kids know, but they uh, they don't they're not the ones that have the power. Right. I mean, I, 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 not only do my, as I said, do I think about my own reflections about, uh, about my place in these vast intricate grids of life that support me, but I think about the future. I have, a, I have four grandchildren. The youngest now is one year old. When he goes off to college or is in college 20 years from now, what will college look like? What will his life be like? 20 years seems like such a long time, but... Um, <laughs> You know, when you're talking about uh, climate change, it's not a long time at all. Yeah. Yeah, I, and you alluded to the, I think that one of the things I love the most about it is that she writes children really well. Oh, and yes. I don't think many authors do that. Not as well as she does, right? Yeah, I, you just love, oh my God, Jack, you just love that kid. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, and, so. and she developed so many other characters. He mm -hmm. was the one that stood out, the yep. one I could handle. but. Uh, Number of the kids have uh, have great personalities, and even the angels when they were when they came and they mm -hmm. were part of it. She developed those characters well yeah. too. Yeah, she had, she had she's written some children's books, mm -hmm. so uh, that, that gives her a little in. But boy, oh boy, she's a, it was a powerful story. Powerful story. So, any other comments or questions from people? If not, oh, I will say, Gary, that we had some in the chat um, appreciation of your um, honoring the indigenous people who oh, thank preceded you. us. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just a reminder to everyone that um, we'll do the Friends Annual Meeting after next week's session, and we hope to see you all then. Okay. There's nothing else. Thanks, Gary. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Stay safe.